Welcome to Live Your Dream Podcast, episode 26, How to Stand Up for What is Right and Rewrite History. I'm your host, Selena Lee. Before I start the show today, I want to give a shout out to my listener who left a review on iTunes. Aria Zaina wrote, insightful and really helpful advice. Really, really well thought out and structured advice. I found the step-by-step approach to be particularly helpful. She's so great with interweaving personal experiences and examples in her lessons, making them both inspiring and comforting. Listening to this podcast is like having someone holding your hand through a really difficult task. It's been really helpful to have Selena's positive voice in my head and urging me on because starting a new thing comes with so much doubt and negative thinking. This podcast is like my positive affirmation. Thank you, Selena. Wow, thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you took the time to not only listen to my show, but to write me this amazing review. I'm a little embarrassed and blushing as I'm reading this, but I wanted to give you a shout out to say a big thank you for taking the time to write me this review. As you know, my podcast is a labor of love and it's a lot of work to create each episode. And whenever I get a review like this, it really motivates me to continue working hard. So if you got any value from listening to my podcast, I would really appreciate it if you can take just a few minutes to give me a rating and write me a review. It's really easy to do it on iTunes and I may give you a shout out in future episodes. For those of you looking for guidance on how to find happiness and fulfillment in your career, I put together a guide to the three steps to finding true career fulfillment. If you're interested, you can download it by clicking on today's show notes on your podcast app or on my website, selinalee.co, that is C-E-L-I-N-A-L-E-E.co. The month of May is the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, and I have a very special conversation that I'm so excited to share with you. Dale Minami is a lawyer who has defended the civil rights of the Asian Americans and other minorities. His parents and his then one-year-old brother were one of 120,000 Japanese Americans the U.S. government incarcerated in concentration camps during the World War II. Dale was born in Southern California and grew up to become a lawyer and led a landmark civil rights lawsuit that overturned a 40-year-old conviction for Fred Korematsu, who refused to go to the government's incarceration camps for Japanese Americans. I thought it would be helpful to provide a bit of background about Fred Korematsu since Dale and I talk about the case during our conversation. Fred Korematsu was a welder and he was in love. He did not want to leave his Caucasian girlfriend, so he refused to obey the government's order to go to the incarceration camps for Japanese Americans. After he was arrested and convicted of defying the government's order, he appealed his case all the way to the Supreme Court. In 1944, the Supreme Court ruled against him, arguing that the incarceration was justified due to military necessity. Forty years later, Dale led the charge to overturn Fred Korematsu's conviction after finding evidences of possible governmental misconduct. In 1983, a federal judge overturned Fred Korematsu's conviction in the same San Francisco courtroom where he had been convicted in 1944. It was a significant moment in civil rights history. Dale gave Japanese Americans and his parents a fair trial that they never had. Dale has also co-founded Asian Law Caucus, the first nonprofit to help poor Asian Americans with legal problems. He has always tried to boost the image of Asian Americans and not just in the courtrooms. He produced two films, Drinking Tea and Life Tastes Good, with all Asian American actors, and both screened at the Sundance Film Festival. When he was in his 50s, People Magazine named him as one of America's top 50 bachelors. Okay, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hi, Dale. Uh, Good morning. (laughs) Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Let's start with your childhood. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Uh, First, let me apologize for my voice. I (laughs) 
was in a conference and I talked too much. Right. It was usual. a late night. <laughs> and it was a late night. So, yeah, I was born in Gardena. It's a little town south of uh, downtown Los Angeles. It's actually right next to South Central near Compton. And uh, I was actually born in East L.A. in a hospital where uh, predominantly Japanese were born there because uh, Japanese were not a, doctors were not allowed privileges at other hospitals. Oh wow! So so many of the Japanese of my generation were born in that hospital. They even called it the Japanese hospital. What did your parents do when you were growing up? Uh, my my father was a gardener, and uh, he also operated a very small sporting goods store. So he had two jobs. Uh, so he'd get up very early to do his gardening, and then go work at his uh, little store in Little Tokyo. Oh, I heard you liked sports growing up. Well, with a father who owns a sporting goods store, you, you're kind of uh, pushed in that uh, that area. So, of course, yeah, we all played a lot of sports. I have two older brothers, ah. so we all played a lot of so sports. So you're the youngest of three. I'm the youngest. Your parents and your brother were one of 120,000 Japanese Americans the U.S. government in prison during the World War II. I think they spent three years in Arkansas. My parents and my older brother were put in the concentration camps, mm -hmm. in first the horse stalls in uh, Santa Anita racetracks, which was converted into a temporary, they called it a euphemism, assembly center. It was a prison. Wow. And then they were transported to Arkansas, where they spent various amounts of times. I think it was about two years. Did your parents talk to you about that experience when you were growing up? You know, like most second generation and East State first generation, they really didn't talk about uh, the prisons much. It was such a shameful experience. It was terrible. And to relive it, it's one of my friends used to call it like a rape victim. Yeah. You know, you were so shamed by it. You just didn't want to, to relive it or talk about it. So we didn't get much information. We saw these old black and white photos we asked about them. We were told they were camps, yeah. but we were not told the whole basis for the incarceration of that mass uh, racial profiling that was done to Japanese Americans. Mm. How did the experience that your parents went through affect how they raised you? I think it affects you in very subtle ways. And uh, there have been even studies how uh, even though the children of these uh, incarcerees didn't know much about uh, their parents' experience, these effects go down generations and generations, psychological uh, issues. And for our family, and I think a lot of Japanese-American families, uh, we were pushed to be 100% American, yeah. which meant, you know, we barely learned much Japanese. Uh, we, we didn't celebrate Japanese holidays as much. We didn't know much about our culture. Uh, we were uh, protected, so to speak, by our parents so that we would never stand out as a racial minority again. Uh, and that way, we would be uh, hopefully assimilated yeah. and that the experience of being incarcerated because of your race would never happen to us again. Right. So you were forced to assimilate, and that was the only way to survive in this country. Yeah, I wouldn't say forced in a sense. I think it was a very subtle way our parents... Uh, wanted to protect us. I see. And so they really didn't um, influence with Japanese ideas or Japanese culture so much. And it's, it's shameful in a way. It's um, a, a deficit not to be able to relate to your, your history, your culture, and uh, accept what is really not an alien culture because we were very Americanized, uh, but to have one-dimensional background like that. Mm -hmm. You have two daughters now, so um, I do. do you do you teach them Japanese? You, you, I know you recently took them to Japan. Oh uh, yes, my well, my my wife my wife's parents are from Japan, mm -hmm. so uh, they taught their children, you know, all the Japanese traditions, Japanese language, Japanese culture, Japanese history, and uh, so my wife is was born in the United States, is bilingual and biliterate, so she's very fluent. And so our children grew up that way. They spoke Japanese as a first language. Wow. And uh, both our babysitters, our, my mother-in-law, who was our babysitter-in-chief, <laughs> you know, teaches them Japanese as well. Yeah. So they go to Japanese school, and they're also bilingual and biliterate. Mm -hmm. 
I think um, even though there wasn't much awareness of the of this fact, um, growing up to be bilingual by culture, I think it's such an asset. It is. Yeah. Yeah, even studies have shown, you know, it makes you smarter. Yeah, so. like you have less um, chance of getting Alzheimer and dementia right. and all yeah. of that. So. so I'm the dumb one in the family. <laughs> And the one that you know doesn't know what anybody's talking about. No. I speak about twenty percent Japanese, so I, I can understand all the bad things they say about me. So you went to USC to study political science, and then you went to UC Berkeley to study law. Um, how did you become interested in law? Uh, you know, as a default. Uh, oh yeah. People ask me why well, you must have thought about this a lot in your life, and I never did. Uh, my father. Uh, influenced me. He said, look at, you know, being a practical man, living through the depression, living through the incarceration experience, he, he felt that it was important for us to have a marketable skill, to be able to have an education. Uh, and he, taught, he told my brother this, he said, they could take away your freedom, but they can't take away your education. Wow. So that influenced my older brother, who, uh, of course, he went to way too much school. He was into <laughs> engineering school, then he went to dental school, then he went to medical school, then wow. he went to a five-year residency. I don't think my father expected that much school. <laughs> so yeah, I, I went there by default because I was interested in social psychology as well. So the choice was law school, social psychology. My father thought uh, law would be a more practical um, course of study. Because, you know, I didn't, he said, I, you don't have to practice law, but it'll give you a background. And I think deep, deep down, you know, the law did not protect our parents. That's uh, right. And like a lot of immigrant parents who, uh, the stories I hear about why students go to law school, many of them are second generation and they've had experience with the law and with uh, racism yeah. that they felt that they could uh, gain some leverage or knowledge of law to essentially protect their families. That's right. And I would imagine that there probably weren't that many Asian Americans in law school. Yeah, at that the time, time there were very few. There were five in my class. Mm -hmm. There were six the year after. And then affirmative action kicked in and 23 Asian Americans oh, wow. were uh, admitted in 1971. Mm -hmm. So it was a it was a sea change of uh, diversity and affirmative action made a huge difference for Asian Americans. Yeah. I went to UC Berkeley Law School too. Oh, you did too? Yeah, yeah. How, Go I Bears. <laughs> Go Bears, that's right. <laughs> How was that like for you? I'm sure it was a really interesting time to be in Berkeley in law school at the time. You know, yeah, I started in 1968 in uh, Berkeley. Uh, literally the day I entered law school, the third world strike had begun in San Francisco State and spread across the Bay to UC Berkeley. There were demonstrations, there were uh, boycotts of classes, uh, there was tear gas, there was a lot of uh, rallies. So a lot of the classes we either couldn't or didn't attend. Uh, but also 1968 was a watershed year for my generation. Uh, it was the year Robert Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King died, the Olympics uh, were held in Mexico City, where, where Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their black fists to protest the discrimination. Uh, it was also uh, a time of ferment uh, and opposition to the Vietnam War uh, and the Contra culture, which celebrated a, a drug, live free, uh, you know, kind of uh, attitude. Also, kind of merged together uh, those three movements created a very a unique, I think, uh, climate for ferment, for social change, for uh, different ways of thinking of things. Yeah. And I think every generation writes its own history, and they have moments in that history where, and pivotal moments, which uh, change the direction of where that generation is going, or it's the way the uh, students uh, or our generation asserts itself and I think 1968 was one of those years. Yeah, and you were right in the middle of all of that action I was. and change. Yeah. yeah. Um, after graduating from law school, you and a group of Asian American law students started Asian Law Caucus, which I think was the first nonprofit to help poor Asian Americans with legal problems. How did you decide to start the organization? Well, because of so much of the uh, ferment 
and so much. I mean, it was partly chaos, but it was sometimes controlled chaos. Um, we saw a need in the community. And in that time, folks were really driven toward social justice issues in my generation. Um, and so we felt that uh, there was a need out there uh, because a lot of uh, Asian Americans who were monolingual were not able to get legal help or insufficient legal help. Uh, and we felt the law could be used to affirmatively help them, not just defend you know, them in courts, but also bring cases and lawsuits that would advance the essentially the empowerment of Asian Americans. So we decided to start this group um, with just a few ragtag volunteers, and uh, we wanted to use law affirmatively again uh, to um, not only help people educate themselves about or educate them about their rights, but to encourage them to act politically, mm -hmm. uh, to assert their rights. So it wasn't just lawyers leading a charge, winning a case in court. Well, everyone else was on the sidelines. We wanted folks to take their own destiny in their own hands and, and actually uh, fight for their rights without lawyers even. There probably weren't that many Asian American attorneys at the time in the courtroom. How was that like? Um, yeah, I saw very few Asian Americans, mm -hmm. uh, very few judges. There was, you know, one or two in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, and many times we encountered racism. I remember going to court and um, happened to be turned the corner to go into a a judge's chamber. It was a, a settlement conference on a criminal defense case. I did a lot of criminal defense then. And I heard the judge talking about niggers and chinks. Oh, wow. Well, niggers he was talking about. And I heard him say, there are a lot of niggers out there talking to the district attorney. And when I turned the corner and he saw me, he tried to make a joke out of it. He said, oh, yeah, and chinks, too. Oh, my gosh. Thinking that, was, thinking that would uh, mollify me and thinking that would, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, discount the, the the racist sentiment that he was saying and try to treat it as a joke, which, of course, I knew it wasn't. Right. And there were judges who uh, tried to get me to interpret for a Chinese client. Mm. When I'd make a motion to get an interpreter, they would say, well, why don't you interpret? And I had to patiently explain to the judge that I was Japanese, that Japanese and Chinese were from different countries, that they had different languages, you had to educate him. Yes, yeah, so I was actually being sarcastic. Oh. <laughs> and the guy said, oh, okay, yeah. Well, the judge said, okay, well, well, we'll get you an interpreter then. Wow. But, you know, it was these, they just messed with you. Yeah. Uh, so it was not easy being an Asian in court because it was, it was an anomaly. It was uh, kind of an aberration for these judges to see Asians appear in court, Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. How did that make you feel? Um. Uh, pissed off I yeah, mean outraged of course. Yeah. of course I you know it, it just uh, reinforced the notion that we needed to fight for our rights mm -hmm. and we need to organize that essentially we need to build power bases and so we organized other organizations uh, to uh, leverage the growing population of Asian Pacific Americans who are practicing law and lobby yeah, absolutely. And stand up as an organization, as a group, mm -hmm. which made it a lot harder for judges to act in such despicable ways. Yeah, and you've sort of used all of your experience as a field to lead the change um, and fight for um, civil rights for a lot of Asian Americans throughout your career. And most importantly, you worked on, you led the charge for Korematsu case. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I think at the core of what drove me mm -hmm. were two almost um, contradictory emotions. One was outrage. Yeah. Outrage that we were not living up to the rhetoric of equal protection. Outrage that we would be treated so poorly in court. But the other one was love. And at this risk of sounding ridiculous, as Che once said, you know, uh, love propels you to do things such as uh, wanting to get the social justice, wanting to help people, wanting to see people rise out of poverty, out of out of poor circumstances, to to occupy, um, you know, a, a place that America has always promised us, you know, the the land of opportunity. But if you're starting from behind the, you know, the starting line, uh, 
you need to get uh, get some help to get toward that uh, finish line. And love of the idea of social justice, love of the idea of equality, too, is equally compelling as outrage. Mm. And so those things kind of pushed me to continue to work on cases. Um, Korematsu was one of those. I had done a number of impact cases or class actions before that. So I had experience doing those cases, uh, but not as big as Korematsu, of course. It was a little bit of a different animal uh, because it was a claim of fraud on the Supreme Court some 40 years before that the government had altered, suppressed, and destroyed evidence, uh, which contradicted their own position that they were arguing in court that Japanese Americans were dangerous, that uh, that in 1944 the decision was based on national security, that Japanese Americans constituted a threat, uh, that they were engaged in espionage and sabotage, when all the official reports that were suppressed said exactly the opposite. Japanese were not a threat. You could take care of this by individual loyalty hearings. Uh, you did not have to incarcerate them en masse, uh, that they did not commit the kind of espionage or sabotage that was claimed by General John DeWitt, the progenitor of the uh, exclusion acts, um, and that those statements he made that Japanese were engaged in these acts of signaling to Japanese ships from Japan Mm -hmm. were absolute falsehoods. And so when that evidence was discovered, I was contacted by Peter Irons, who was one of the people who did discovered the evidence along with a woman named Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig, who coincidentally I had met some eight years before in New York. <clears throat> and they had found some astounding evidence, not only of uh, the reports that showed that the government was lying, but actual memos from the attorneys for the government uh, who, who told their superiors, the solicitor general, we're telling outright lies. Wow. It would be highly unfair to this racial minority that these lies put out in an official publication go uncorrected. They called it the uh, approximation of the suppression of evidence. They said it was unethical. And yet the Solicitor General, uh, you know, who argued in the Supreme Court, failed to apprise the Supreme Court of that contradictory evidence. Mm-hmm. Clearly a ethical violation. Right. Uh, and as a result, the Supreme Court never saw those those uh, contradictory uh, reports and uh, uh, statements. Wow. So can you talk a little bit about um, the Korematsu case from, from the beginning and then how you were able to overturn it some 40 years later? Well, the ori- original Korematsu case was really uh, follows in the footsteps of uh, Gordon Hirabayashi and Minyasui's case. Those cases were heard earlier. Uh, a year and a half earlier, the court, the Supreme Court had manipulated the entire procedural uh, history to make sure that they could take the what they considered uh, lesser violations of curfew first. Mm-hmm. Um, and even in Gordon Hirabayashi's cases, they actually manipulated that case to not even hear his claim of uh, exclusion of Japanese Americans from the West Coast, the, the, essentially the banishment. And uh, so those cases were heard earlier before Fred Korematsu brought his case, which uh, alleged even greater violations, both the exclusion of Japanese Americans and the detention. Mm -hmm. So in Gordon's case, the court established the baseline, deferring to the Supreme Court without any kind of searching scrutiny of the evidence, accepting blindly what the uh, government and the War Department had said about Japanese Americans, there was no evidence Mm -hmm. of Japanese Americans ever committing espionage or sabotage. So the government established a, uh, or created a a theory, a theory of ethnic characteristics, Mm -hmm. that because of their particular or peculiar ethnic characteristics, Japanese were, it was impossible to tell the loyal from the disloyal. Wow. They had... um, uh, they, didn't, they didn't have any expert opinions, any evidence at all. So they had to uh, create by judicial notice the notion that Japanese Americans sent their children to Japan for an education, that Japanese Americans went to uh, uh, Japanese language schools, 
that they worship the Shinto religion. These are all uh, indicators mm -hmm. of disloyalty, according to the court. Wow. Very thin, uh, racist, essentially, theory. But they had to come up with something because they had no evidence of the danger of Japanese Americans. So the court, uh, in, in an unusual decision, in the way they wrote it, using the double negative, yeah. Instead so of explain saying, it for um, non-lawyers uh, listening. <laughs> yeah, instead of directly saying the Japanese are dangerous and um, you know we support the government's uh, arguments, they said we cannot say that they did not have reason. Oh my gosh! You know, a very convoluted way that the way that makes English teachers cringe. Yeah, absolutely. You know? mm -hmm. And as I tell people, it's like going home on Valentine's Day and <laughs> telling your significant other significant other, no, honey, I cannot say I do not love you. <laughs> you know, it's a very weak way, and it actually is an indicator that the court was very uncomfortable Absolutely. with finding that, yeah, Japanese were prone to espionage and sabotage by their own ethnic characteristics. Mm -hmm. And how did they uh, differentiate Germans and Italians? Well, they didn't. But historically, the revival of that Oh, inscrutability argument. Asians cannot be understood because they're so unusual and their culture is so foreign and alien to us. That was revived and uh, inserted in very magniloquence or magniloquent language to make it sound like they were really supporting, yeah. you know, civil rights and the rights of Japanese when essentially they were not. I see. So that reasoning carried over to Korematsu. And by the time Korematsu was heard a year and a half later, the government had committed additional acts of misconduct. They altered the final report, the basis for the, uh, for the court's decision about Japanese Americans. And they had destroyed the original copies, which uh, said that, well, it's not a matter of time. We have enough time. It's not that there's insufficient time to have individual loyalty oaths. It's just impossible to separate, as they put it, the sheep from the goats, mm -hmm. the loyal from the disloyal. Well, that, of course, would not fly in the Supreme Court, according to some of the superiors. So they had that original report changed to say just exactly the opposite, that it's a matter of we didn't have enough time. Wow. So 180 degrees, they changed that report. They burned all the copies. Oh, my God. The certificate of burning was uh, formally... Uh, put in the archives, mm -hmm. but by chance one copy remained, and one copy found by Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig and Peter Irons uh, found the discrepancy, the contradiction, and that, become a, that became a smoking gun argument for us uh, in all of our cases, in our petition to have these men's uh, convictions overturned. Mm -hmm. For the non-lawyers or non-Americans listening to this podcast, can you briefly explain how the Korimas case even came about. So I heard he was a Japanese-American citizen born in the U.S., and he was in love with his Caucasian girlfriend and didn't want to be imprisoned. Yeah, for, for Fred, um, it was such a simple matter of equality. Uh, he, Gordon uh, Hirabayashi... Uh, one of the first ones arrested. Min Yasui was the first one arrested. He was a lawyer, mm -hmm. so he knew his constitutional rights. Gordon Uribayashi was a uh, student, a graduate student, very educated. Fred was a welder. He was an everyday citizen, but he had a deep sense of justice, of equality. Uh, so he felt that, wait, why am I going away? I didn't do anything wrong. You know, the Japanese didn't do anything wrong, so... I'm going to hide away and see if I can get away with it, which, of course, he couldn't. He was turned in. Uh, the authorities found him. Uh, he was hoping to, to, to elope with his girlfriend and move to another part of the country where there was no exclusion order prohibiting him from staying in uh, San Leandro in Oakland where he was living. So for Fred, it was just a, a simple matter of there's no reason that we should be treated like anyone else. Right. It was fundamentally uh, a sense of justice that drove Fred. Mm. So he, I heard he um, very poorly changed uh, the driver's license, I think, and yeah, he, got a minor plastic surgery. Yeah, he, had, he did have some minor plastic surgery, which 
you know, when we first met him, we were all very curious because <laughs> he had not appeared in public very often. Uh, we were curious to what he looked like. He looked just like any other Japanese Americans you you would see. I uh, changed his name to Clyde Sarah to um, pretend he was a Hawaiian, uh, but it was clear that he kind of whited out his name, or scratched it <laughs> off, and put a new name on on his license. Mm -hmm. So then he was found guilty, and then. Forty years later, at the same court where he was found guilty, his case was overturned, and you were part of part of that. Yeah, we had a wonderful work team. <clears throat> so it wasn't just me; a bunch of ton of people worked on this. We had about ten core lawyers that worked with us, and similarly in Seattle and Portland, uh, Gordon and Min respectively had their teams argue their cases. Uh, we went back to that courtroom on a very uh, little known legal procedure called the called writ of error quorum nobis. Mm -hmm. and, and it simply means that you can correct a fundamental injustice even many years later based on newly discovered evidence. And that evidence, of course, was the burning of the DeWitt report. It was the other official reports that were suppressed. Uh, and we filed that petition we went to court, uh, and it was packed with, you know, hundreds of people because it was uh, a, a trial that the Japanese Americans never had. So many of the people in the audience were folks from uh, who had gone to the the, the, the prisons. Uh, there were Japanese Americans who suffered like my parents. Yeah, and they were there to hear our case. It wasn't clear that the court was going to actually rule that day. Uh, we were there to argue uh, whether the court should make findings of facts. In other words, the court could come to conclusions about our facts and discuss our facts. We had hoped that the court would uh, find that there was no military necessity to imprison Japanese Americans, that, the, that misconduct and racism uh, drove the court's decision in 1944, and that uh, the government con uh, committed acts of misconduct by suppressing, altering, and destroying evidence. Uh, so we made our arguments, and I began by saying, we are here today to seek a measure of justice denied to the Fred Korematsu and the Japanese-American community some 40 years ago. And then I went on to describe and explain why we absolutely had to have these findings. The context is important because we were in the middle of a, of a campaign by Japanese Americans to seek redress and reparations uh, from the government. Oh, that's right. They were fighting uh, for a bill uh, in Congress to, to gain an apology and $20,000 mm -hmm. for every Japanese American then living who was imprisoned or suffered the consequences of these exclusion orders. So a judicial declaration uh, had never been made. Uh, there were a lot of people in our community who were very fearful about our case that we would lose again. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, that did cross our minds, but we were young and stupid. <laughs> you were in your 30s. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, young and actually, you know, you had no fear in those days. <laughs> and so we, and we had the best evidence I had ever seen in a, in a, in a case um, the so-called smoking guns. Mm -hmm. And we had the best judge we could find, um, whom we knew we would get a fair hearing from. So it, it, was, pre it was very tense. Uh, and that hearing, uh, we went on for several hours. Fred was able to give a statement, which we asked the court to indulge us and let him uh, uh, state. And he, he said that he came to this court the last time 40 years ago in chains, in handcuffs, and that he was doing this not just for himself, not just for Japanese Americans, so, but so that this would never, ever happen to another American again. Very forceful speech. The government made their argument, and to our surprise, the judge ruled from the bench. Wow. She made a brilliant, articulate statement about exactly what we had asked for. The Japanese Americans uh, were, and Fred were treated unjustly. There was no military necessity. That racism propelled the 
decision to imprison Japanese Americans that the government deliberately and intentionally altered and suppressed evidence. Yeah. Uh, so we got everything we wanted. It was a remarkable moment. How did it make you feel? Well, you know, I had chills because it yeah. was such a articulate statement. She ended talking about how may this be a warning to the rest of the country that the petty fears and prejudices so easily aroused by international hostilities should not be allowed to prevent the government institutions from protecting civil rights. It was prophetic. It was wise. Uh, it was eloquent. And so I turned to Fred. And this is why I never forget this moment, <laughs> because Fred, uh, we were all standing with the legal teams from the other cases, too. They had all come down to watch this hearing. Fred was looking, staring blankly, like about a foot over my head. And I said, hey, Fred, this is great. And without even looking at me, he said, what happened? Wow. <laughs> I said, Fred, you won. You won your case. <laughs> and a couple heartbeats later, Fred goes, oh, that's good. That's good. Without even looking at me. Mm. And uh, I had realized that this man had carried this burden yeah. of losing the case in 1944 that validated the imprisonment of his whole community. Absolutely. And he carried that burden, ostracized for making that bold move then um, for many years. And when the burden was finally lifted, mm -hmm. it was almost too difficult to comprehend. Wow. So he couldn't really process what was going on he at could that not. moment. You know, it took him weeks to do that, actually. Mm -hmm. And then when we started celebrating, he started realizing what he had done. Wow. And, uh, and he, was, he was elated. He was really thrilled. I mean, what a meaningful moment in American history, because I remember when I was in law school, we studied this case. Oh, you know? really? Good. Yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> um, how did your parents and your family react to, to this? Um, my parents, once the redress movement began and Japanese Americans started telling their stories, it unloosened the tongues of all, a lot of Japanese Americans. It lifted... Uh, the cloud of suspicion that they were spies and saboteurs uh, as the evidence came forward, uh, it validated what they were uh, they were saying or they thought all along that you know we did nothing wrong. We were loyal American citizens. And for us it was it was a sweet validation for them because you know for all the sacrifices they went through to send their children to college and law school, Finally, we as young lawyers had a chance to give something back to them, yeah. uh, a sense of dignity, mm -hmm. uh, a validation uh, that they were right and they did nothing wrong. Right. And so uh, they were really, uh, you know, in their own Japanese way, <laughs> very, very, very happy uh, to know that at some point in their lives, this terrible, terrible injustice had been partially corrected. Mm -hmm. And I think they felt that they had recovered their political birthright to stand up and speak out, that they had done nothing wrong, and that was proven not just in court, by, but by the government reports that later came down. Yeah. It's so meaningful that, you know, your parents went through this terrible injustice even before you were born. And then they worked hard to raise you, educate you, sent you to law school, and then you... <laughs> You gave them the trial that they never had. You had a chance to correct the history. Yeah, maybe even more meaningful for my parents because I was kind of a little um, jerk really? growing up. I was very <laughs> contentious and rebellious, and mm. I gave my parents fits. <laughs> and uh, they probably thought I could be a lawyer because I was so contentious as a child. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, that all this, I guess, this contrarian behavior actually came to fruition in a decent way by, you know, fighting the government. <laughs> and I don't know if they ever, I'm sure they thought that. They thought, whew, he finally turned out okay. <laughs> finally. <laughs> yeah. I think you turned out okay. <laughs> you always try to boost the image of Asian Americans and not just in the courtroom. And in your 40s, you post for a calendar shirtless. <laughs> Um, I think uh, it was. Yeah, <laughs> um, vaguely remember that. 
I think it was a San Francisco State Asian American Studies professor who wanted to change the stereotypes of Asian American men as being like subservient, sexless. And so he came to you and said, hey, can you um, post for a calendar? And you post one of you working on the job and then one of you shirtless. I think you're Mr. June and July, right? <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> How was that like? <laughs> Well, you, the idea was to change the image of Asian American men. And um, um, so, you know, I thought that was a worthy project. The, uh, the funds raised were going to go to student organizations. Um, and, and, you know, kind of a lot of times in my life, it was the, the question I'd ask myself was, why not? Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to why? And so I thought, why not? So I didn't expect it to be like, uh, gain the kind of notoriety it did. I also thought I was going to be posing in my basketball uniform, which I brought to the photo shoot. Uh, and then the uh, photographer rolled up my shorts, uh, told me to take off my basketball jersey, and started shooting. And it was a little bit of a surprise. <laughs> um, and so it did gain a lot of uh, controversy at one level because it had never been done before. Uh, and there were not a lot of humorous messages going back and forth, letters I got, uh, <laughs> comments I got. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was an experience. Um, also, <clears throat> I think in your 50s, People Magazine named you as one of America's top 50 bachelors, right? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> you must have been quite a celebrity in your time. Um I, I, I wouldn't say a celebrity. Because <laughs> I would imagine there probably weren't any Asian men, or at least one, you must have been one of the very few, to be named as one of the bachelors by the People magazine. Yeah, I think uh, Jeff Yang, one of my friends, and mm -hmm. another uh, Asian American was also in that edition, I believe. And, oh, Tiger Woods, he was, you know, half Asian. Um, and, of course, my uh, fame... Uh, Probably co-equal to his, of course, uh, but I'm kidding. <laughs> but but yeah, that's that's true, and that also that it wasn't so controversial mm. for a reason. And I'm not sure why. I, I guess probably because it was such a mainstream magazine, you know. So people did react, uh, some of them incredulously. Uh, why was I in there? And uh, <laughs> I don't know. I said I just said why not? Why not? Right. And yeah. that seems to be how. You how you lived your whole life, you know, why not? Why not try Yeah, I'm, I'm why not, not a very deep thinker. Mm. I'm, you know, fairly superficial. So <laughs> decisions come quick and sometimes wrongly mm. uh, made, but uh, other times, you know, it just allows you to live life spontaneously a little more. And that leads me to the question about, you also made two films, Drinking Tea and Life Tastes Good, both screened at the Sundance. That's correct. I, yeah. I, I, I was the executive producer, so mm -hmm. which that meant is I just raised the money. Mm -hmm. uh, which is I, a big part of uh, making films. A oh, big, big, big mm -hmm. part. Probably the biggest part. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> right. And I worked with Philip Kahn Gotanda, mm -hmm. who you know was a well-known playwright at the time. And so we, again, wanted to change the image of Asian Americans. So we had a film uh, uh, that had virtually nothing to do with Asian Americans, but all the actors were Asian American. I see. And so for folks who are non-Asian Americans to enjoy a film and subtly, subtly influenced by the fact that all the actors are Asian yeah. and not see them as something foreign, they're all speaking without accents, right. uh, would hopefully gain a measure of... of respect and uh, acceptance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to use the media. I always thought the media was very significant in framing attitudes and perceptions, such as this podcast, for example. Yes, so thank you so much for yeah. being here. So you've had such a successful career. I'm sure you've also met a lot of success people. Um, what have you learned about success that you can share with us? You know, it's hard to say what success is. Right. I think living a fulfilled life, uh, being happy, contributing to the greater good of society, having friends, and now having a family with two little girls that I started a family quite late at age 63. It was pretty surreal. Um, so now I have two, two children. Um, and so how you measure success, I think, is always individual. And some people think it's having a lot of money. Uh, some people is having a lot of fame. Uh, but for me, it's more about having personal fulfillment and making some contribution to the betterment of this country, 
to move us forward, even if it's a little bit. Uh, and I think everybody, I believe they just owe that to society, to do something good. And I think uh, it's a quote that I had heard to the graduating class of the Antioch uh, College years ago. Um, be afraid to die unless you have won some victory for humanity. Wow. And I really believe in that. Mm. So how do we have the courage to stand up for what we believe in, even if it may cost us? Oh, that's such a hard thing to do, you know. Mm. And that's also so partly individual. But, but, but I think other people inspire you, and friends inspire you, and uh, role models inspire you. Uh, you know, you don't grow up in a vacuum, and I didn't grow up with courage. You know, some people do naturally, but it had to be um, driven by love and outrage, like I had said, mm -hmm. and uh, a sense of, uh, you know, who you are and how you got there. I think understanding history is really critical mm. because then you understand where you came from. And to me, history is like a river. It's you're, You find your place in that river that's flowing by you, and uh, you find yourself not alone but with a sense of community. Uh, you find your place in history. You find your place in your present time. And, uh, and as you find your place, you find you, that you're not alone. You're part of an evolving, growing community, and that... Uh, as history, uh, you could look back and see where you came from. Yeah. But you could look forward, too, and see where you can go. Yeah. So understanding history is really critical to understanding yourself and, uh, and how you can contribute and why. Mm. We all know no one succeeds alone and no one achieves dreams alone. So who helped you to get to where you are now? Well, I, there's a lot of people, some of the early lawyers, Ken Kawaichi, Joe Morizumi, uh, I think uh, I've had, you know, these all these models, and I, I wish I could name them all. I just forgot <laughs> right now. But l lots of people help you along the way, and there's not one uh, overarching influence. You know, I get my uh, my ideas from Emma Salazar, a Filipina who fought against Blue Shield, and I represented her in a class action dis empl employment discrimination. That's right. And the courage she had to do this was something that, you know, I could probably never do, but, mm. you know, she inspired me. Uh, and just some of the everyday workers you see going going to work every day and uh, single parents, now that I know how difficult it is to raise children, to have a single woman or single father raise their kids, uh, to me is uh, an act of amazing fortitude. Yeah, absolutely. And those kind of people are inspiring to me. Yeah. Dale, thank you so much for your courage, for your inspiration, and for being who you are, for everything that you have done. Well, so, thank you, <laughs> thank thank you Dale. This. I really, really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for listening. And I hope my conversation with Dale has inspired you to think about how you can do meaningful work in your career. To help you, I put together a guide to the three steps to finding true career fulfillment. If you're interested, you can download by clicking on today's show notes on your podcast app or on my website, selinalee.co, C-E-L-I-N-A-L-E.co. And please subscribe on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And while you're at it, I would really appreciate it if you can please write me a review. I'm relying on you to help me to grow my podcast. So if you got any value out of it, I would be so grateful if you can tell one friend about it. For questions about my coaching or to reach out to me with any thoughts or questions about my podcast, you can also visit my website, selinalee.co, and I look forward to hearing from you. So thank you so much, and I'll be back soon with another episode. I hope you have a great week.